So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon when you're joining us from today. And thanks so much for taking some of your time to hear about positive role models and my journey in STEM. So today I'm going to talk you through how I got to where I am currently, some of the hurdles that I've had along the way and some of the people who were an inspiration to me and why I'm so passionate about giving back and trying to help those see what a fantastic opportunity a career in STEM is. This is just a short disclaimer. So chemical engineering, why did I decide to study chemical engineering? So when I was at school, that budding, young, brace-faced, smiling teenager there really enjoyed a lot of the sciences and was quite a big geek, to be honest. I played the saxophone, I went to science club and I wasn't so keen on English. I liked to read some books, but I wasn't too keen on English and I knew that maths and sciences were my strong point. At the time, I actually thought I wanted to be a dentist, but the way the schooling system worked, I actually started school a little earlier than usual. And so when it was actually the week to go on work experience, I wasn't able to go for age reasons. So I spent the week uh, at school and when I went into fifth year, I thought that's it. I'm, you know, I'm definitely going to be a dentist. Sixth year came around, it was time to apply to university and in the UK you have to do some additional testing to apply to be a dentist called the UK CAT test. So I studied for that and I did the test. I then about two weeks before it was time to submit my application went on work experience with a parent's friend and I think about maybe day three I think it's in some root canal treatment being done and I came home and said dad I just can't do that um, dentistry is not for me I just there's no way I can do that as a career and it's like what with you know you've just done this studying you've just done this test what are you going to do? And I really wasn't very sure, but I had a, a bit more time because for dentistry and medicine, you apply about four months sooner than the rest of the application. So I had a few more months to figure out what I was going to do. And at the time, my dad's golfing buddy, two of his sons did chemical engineering and they were about 10 years older than me. And he came home one day and told me a bit about the industries that they worked in. One of them worked for British Sugar, the other worked in the energy industry. And it seemed like there was a wide range of things that you could go and do. So I could work in the food sector, I could work in the drinks industry, I could work in the fast moving consumer goods sector. And it sounded like those doors were all going to be open regardless of what decision I made right now throughout my course. So I quite liked the idea that this gave me a bit more time to figure out exactly what I wanted to do and that, yeah, it was going to involve science and maths, the things that I was good at. And actually also with quite a hands on course, it was a balance of studying and learning combined with practical subjects and practical hands on experiments. And I also knew that around the globe it was internationally recognised so I knew there would be an opportunity to maybe go out with the UK and potentially in the future have an international career. What I didn't know was the incredible experience I was about to embark on and some of the opportunities that were about to come my way. Now, I must say I'm a big believer of it's not you kind of create your own luck. And if you work hard enough and look for the opportunities, then they will come your way. But this year is just a short selection of some of the photos of the experiences that I had during my time. So I joined um, straight out of school, went to first year of university and in the UK, between Scotland and England, there's a bit of a difference in the grades that you require to go to university. So in Scotland, it takes five years to complete a master's degree. And the first year is typically to get everybody to the equivalent level of A-level maths and science. So you do a couple of foundation engineering classes, but you don't really get into what the course is all about until after your first year. So at the end of my first year, I had a part time job in the local tax office, believe it or not, they were a popular employer in my area and popular with some, unpopular with others. But I worked there and they were a fantastic employer throughout my time at university. They were really flexible with the internships that I had. They were really flexible with exam time and the time off that I needed for studying. So I did that and that gave me, um, you know, real work ethic, timekeeping, a lot of transferable skills that I could then use when it came to second year to apply for an industry placement. So at the time, I was part of a network at university called Interconnect, which is run by an association called Equate Scotland. And they offer a range of female only STEM opportunities. And it was on this site that I noticed an opportunity to go to Dubai. Now, I lived at home my whole time at university and I thought, God, that would be brilliant to go and work, you know, for a full summer in a different country. But at the time, you needed a particular visa and I didn't have it. So I thought about applying, left it a month or so, and then there came another email 
email to say that the visa requirements had been removed and it was now going to be sponsored so it was open to everybody. So I applied and was very fortunate to be granted an internship through an initiative called Athena Swan in Dubai and I went there to work for six weeks as an intern to the Director of Petroleum Engineering at the Heriot Watt campus there. And my parents still laugh now because I actually went with six weeks worth of clothes so I didn't have to do any washing whilst I was on this internship and it's ludicrous to think about now but I think at the time I was just trying to maximise adventure time when I wasn't working. And as part of that internship, I did a lot of STEM outreach. So you see a photo of me here with a young girl and she's sucking milk out of a chocolate milk carton with a very long straw. Now, this is just an example of one of the many hands on experiments and activities I do with young school children. And this one in particular is a chocolate milk carton. You build up straws and get them to try and suck some milk out of the carton after each straw. And the more straws they build up, the harder it is for them to get the milk out of the carton. And that's to demonstrate that the further you drill for oil, the harder it is to get out of the ground. It's a really simple, fun and practical exercise that you could do within a variety of different ways to teach them basic concepts. And that's from a company known as SPE Energy for Me. And they have a wealth of amazing resources that you can do similar activities like with your children in, in classrooms. So I thoroughly enjoyed that experience, really, really rewarding. And I was very fortunate to have a female boss, which in the Middle East in a very male dominated environment was very unique at the time. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Sarika Varma, who's a big, been a big role model of mine slightly later in the presentation. So I returned home and I thought, right, that was great. A full summer out of rainy Scotland, where can I go next? And I knew that you know, there was a few different opportunities, didn't know where I'd be able to go, but I'd heard somebody speak at one of my lectures about this organisation called the Saltire Foundation. And the Saltire Foundation are an extension of Entrepreneurial Scotland. They offer internships to students in the UK, uh, in Scotland, sorry, who are studying at UK universities and you can go all around the world so I thought that sounds quite good I'll apply to that and see how I get on and I was very fortunate to be selected to go and work for Texas Aero Engine Services which was a joint venture between Rolls-Royce and American Airlines in all places of Dallas Texas so I went to Texas for 12 weeks and I worked at an aircraft hangar where we overhauled RB211 and Trent 800 engines which are the two photos you see in the top right and bottom left hand corner and I can definitely confirm that I didn't always quite look like that in a white dress when I was at the aircraft hangar. Those photos are actually on my last day of my internship. I often looked far more like I do in the bottom right photo in a boiler suit, hands on getting dirty, seeing how they took apart these engines and put them back together. And oh, it was just brilliant. It was so good to be on the shop floor to learn about the different engine parts. And you know, before I went to that role, I didn't, I didn't know anything about aviation. I hadn't learned anything about it at university. But what I thoroughly enjoyed about that internship was the fast paced environment, the operational changes every day, the getting to work with a multitude of different people in a variety of teams. And I really thought, OK, I think operations could maybe be something for me, but I don't think aviation is for me. And it's really important to find out and to encourage children to find out what they don't want to do as much as what they do want to do, because it really helps you on the path when there's that many opportunities. So I returned to university and I applied for uh, an award undergraduate of the year and I was very fortunate to be runner up in that award for female undergraduate of the year and it too was sponsored by Rolls-Royce coincidentally and I was offered an opportunity in their aviation team in Derby and having just done aviation the previous summer I thought you know I want to do something a bit different and I asked if there were any opportunities in their nuclear team. They came back with an opportunity to work in nuclear, but I thought, you know, as much as I really enjoyed the operations, I actually think I'd like to find out a bit more about what oil and gas has got to offer. So I applied to Shell's internship programme and found myself in 2016 in the far less glamorous location of Aberdeen, Scotland, which is just as great as they say in the Granite City. And I worked there for 12 weeks on an assessed internship. I worked as a process engineer, which is probably the closest link in terms of core subjects learned at university transferred into a real life role. And it was really, really enjoyable. I, I really learned and met a lot of different people and thoroughly enjoyed the industry, like the company, but wasn't too sure about the process engineering role. So I asked what other jobs were available and I'd mentioned that I really enjoyed working in operations previously. 
So I got a role with them in an operations role and the picture you see of me in the bottom right hand corner is in the first role I had out of university working as a shift supervisor at a gas terminal about 30 miles north of Aberdeen. Now this couldn't have been further from what I probably expected my role would be when I went to university and to say this role was easy would be far from the truth. I arrived here uh, 22 straight out of university in charge of a team of five white British men who were all much more senior than me in age and far more experienced than I was and it was a real learning curve of getting to know people, how to pull on the strengths of your team and how to show your value in different ways and it was Although it was a really steep learning curve, it set me such good ground for the career that I've gone on to have still early days at Shell. But one of the things that was most shocking about this first role was that there was no female toilet in the ops building when I arrived there. So to give you an idea, at a gas terminal, you often have an admin building, which is blast proof and is where the majority of office workers sit. And then you have the main plant where there's a control room, which when you're in the operations team is where you spend a lot of your time as your central base. So there were three male toilets and changing rooms there and not a female one. And as one of two females and a team of 30 in operations we made it our mission to change that and we did eventually have a, a female toilet and dressing room altered as one of the from one of the male ones so that was the kind of first insight into you know you're working in a really male dominated environment but you can make small changes that make your working day easier since then I've gone on to have a, a range of different opportunities and it's now brought me to the role that I'm in now so I presently work as what's called a hydrocarbon scheduler what does that actually mean I look after two main pipelines that are in the Northern North Sea in the northeast of Scotland, which account for 20% of the UK gas supply. This is made up of over 30 offshore fields, 50 commercial agreements, 1800 kilometres of pipeline and 30 different export locations by ship of the product that we then have. And that all in all, really all it does is keep two and a half million homes warm. And that's something I'm really proud to say that I do every day. You know, I get up, I work in this hydrocarbon scheduling role and I help keep part of the energy industry ticking over and finding that thing that gets you out of bed every morning and makes you excited to be in the team that you work in is what I think having passion and part of your career is really about. Part of this role brings together the logistical and operational skills I learned in my internship in Texas and when I worked at the gas terminal and it also brings together my people skills which is my favourite part of the role. My boss would say I could chat to anybody all day but it's true I really thrive on interaction with people and that's the part of the role I enjoy the most. I work with customers in the UK and across the Norwegian continental shelf which is just really interesting every day working whether it's across time zones or operational differences it's a really interesting role and every day no two days are the same so after all of that it kind of brings me to you know who's been pivotal in my role to get to where I am so a big person for me is my dad he taught me the true meaning of work ethic and knowing that you deserve to be in the room when I first turned up in that role at St Fergus at the gas plant in my boiler suit, feeling very out of my depth, it's very easy to quickly think that you know you don't deserve to be there or that you're too young to be in that role, you don't know enough yet to be in the role. And that's not true. Often actually a lot of these companies want you to be a fresh pair of eyes. They want you to inspire people and tell them what's new, what's your change in your voice, a different side and a different perspective to hear. And he taught me the real importance of work ethic and if you you just work at it long enough and hard enough more than nine times out of ten you'll eventually get there and the other lady in this photo is Srika Varma who I spoke about who I met in the Middle East when I was working there in 2014 and we're still in very close contact now she was um a, a Middle Eastern lady who was educated in London and had worked in London but was now back working in the Middle East. She was a civil engineer by background but was the only female head of department at the time at the university and after going to two conferences with her in the petroleum engineering sector it was very quick to recognise that we were the only two females in the room. And it didn't take long to know that she was so well respected and the reputation, her reputation preceded her. You know she'd been so well well respected through work that she'd carried out through people that she knew in industry that it made her life a lot easier there but it was really inspirational to watch this woman in a position of leadership and she was a complete role model for me and is something that has stuck with me throughout the entirety of, of my career and this is where role models are so important and books like Tara and Danny Bin's books that Collins have done are so important as a tool to show young children the real life people who are out there doing fantastic 
fantastic skills and jobs within the STEM sector. I'm a big believer of you can't be what you can't see. And I didn't know until much later in my education and university career about the opportunities that were actually available to me. And I think if I'd known that sooner or seen somebody who was just like me a lot sooner, I maybe would have, not saying I would have done something different, but I maybe would have been a bit more aware of the wealth of opportunities that were open to me. I was very fortunate to have a dad who pushed me and wanted to know about a lot of the opportunities that were on offer, but many parents don't know the opportunities that are on offer. And one of the biggest gaps that we have here are in apprenticeships. If I'd known at university, at school, sorry, the opportunities that are available not only with university but with apprenticeships, I might have taken a different career path and being able to equip teachers in the UK with that knowledge of what's on offer to, you know, to the parents, they can then equip their children with that knowledge and that's just something I really want to stress to of how important it is to know what opportunities are available for the kids. Amongst all of this, I've been really fortunate to be part of the, the WISE campaign and the WISE family and I first came across WISE in 2018. I was very fortunate to be nominated for and awarded the 2018 Women in Science and Engineering One to Watch Award, which is for those under 25 who have made a real contribution in the STEM ambassador space and are giving back and helping inspire future generations. WISE are a campaign that is now an independent community interest group and we're working with a growing network of both corporate and academic members to reach a goal of 30% of women working in core STEM subjects. The previous goal was to reach 1 million women working in STEM and we reached that last year which I'm just so proud to have been a part of. Throughout the, the WISE campaign they have an opportunity for their members companies to have somebody sit on what's called the WISE Young Professionals Board. And after my experience with the WISE campaign in 2018, I decided that that's something I would quite like to be a part of. So I applied and was fortunate enough to take a role on the WISE Young Professionals Board and I've sat on the board since 2019. As part of being on the board, we get involved in a numerous amount of activities, including finding role models for the HarperCollins Tara and Danny Bin series, which has been brilliant to speak to people about their jobs and then say, oh, look, you could appear in a book and somebody could want to be just like you. Whenever I was at school, I used to get you know, really inspired and I used to think I only want to do a job that if somebody presents I want to think I want to be just like them and I now try to aspire to be that person or find those people for other young children. WISE also have what's known as the 10-step policy. This is an industry-led initiative designed specifically for STEM employers to support the attack attraction, progression and retention of female employees. This is something that a lot of research has done into about why women leave the sector, why women are afraid to join the sector or refrain from joining the sector in the first place. And to know that my company that I work for are supportive of this is really encouraging as a young woman in industry. As part of the Wise Young Professionals Board, we're made up of people from data scientists to those who work for pharmaceutical companies, those who work in the sporting sector, to those who work in broadcasting. We're a real mixed bunch and we get to challenge the Wise main campaign and Wise Board and, and make sure that they're hearing the voice of those that are feeling the pain points, what's affecting people and how are they able to help. I would encourage you to reach out to us if there's anything we can do to help you or if it's something you would like to know more about. We're on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter and Instagram. So please just reach out if you have any questions or would like to know a bit more about how you can get involved. We always have projects and competitions running that I'm sure would be in inspirational to some of the children that you work with. Before I leave you today, I would just like to play a short video for you all. So I'm just going to ask Jan now to share a video for you. Those clothes don't make you look good. Are you putting on weight or something? She only got the position because she's a woman. You don't want to be an engineer. That's a man's job. These are real things women engineers have actually heard. Why doesn't your husband just let you stay home? Hey, sweetie, when you got a man, I'll get a cup of coffee. Look who's wearing earrings today. You got promoted too? So we've only got one lady's bathroom. It's up three flights of stairs. Nice breath, Sarah. Good to see you making an effort. File that for me. That's good girl. Oh, great. I'm so glad there's another we woman here. We won't tiptoe around you because you're a woman, you know. You still have to put in the same amount of work. So I guess you'll be starting a family soon, huh? Hey, guys, no sweating. There's a woman in the room. I don't think this university is ready for a female president. Are you sure you'll be able to handle this course? It's, it's quite advanced. We'll do the more 
technical stuff and you can uh, take notes, okay? This work is very strong. Have you thought about applying for the Chancellor's Fellowship too? You're so good at math and science, you have to apply to these top universities. Have you thought about a career in engineering? I'll help you research and we'll put together a poster for the science. Who's my clever girl? Did you build that all by yourself? That's amazing, I'm so proud of you. Be the difference. Close the gender gap. Let's make the future. And what would you say if you heard someone saying these things? I would say, why would you say something like that? I can do whatever you can do. And even if you do think that, we women will show you that we can do it. Comment below what you would say. Thank you. Just. So I'm sure throughout that there's something that res resonates with many of you. I know that I all too many times was told at university that I only got the opportunity because I was a girl. I was only doing it because they needed to, to tick a box or, you know, meet a quota. And it's important to remind yourself that that isn't true. I became an engineer to, to be better, to make a difference, to be at the forefront of the industry that I wanted to work in. And that's why I'm so proud to be working for a forward thinking company like Shell, who are going to be such a huge part of the energy transition and getting us to a net zero economy by 2050 or sooner. You know, by working for such a forward thinking company, you get to be at the forefront of a lot of the initiatives and see the difference that fantastic women and men in the industry make. But what's always been really about for me is giving back, as I said, and trying to be that role model for, for future generations. So to the young boys and girls who are looking to engineering and wondering if it's a career that could be right for them, I want to light the spark for them for engineering the way that others have done for me. And to use their teachers, I ask you to please use the resources that are out there, show them the fantastic books like the Tara and Danny Bind models and show them that there are real people doing really fantastic jobs in the STEM sector. The more that we can share the stories of the fantastic people that work in these organisations, the more they'll be inspired to consider a career in STEM and think about maybe doing something a bit different. Just last week, one of the role models from the Tara Bin series, Ella Podmore, was crowned the Young Woman Engineer of the Year by the IET organisation in the UK. She's a fantastic young woman who works for McLaren Motor Racing as a materials scientist. I mean, that's just so cool. If I'd known jobs like that were around when I was at school, then maybe I would have done materials science instead. But I ask you to continue to keep inspiring them and for you to be the difference and help make their future much better too. And now I'd just like to welcome any questions. There's some details here of how you can get in touch with Collins. As Jan mentioned at the start, they will send forward an email about your certificates and any further registration. But if you have any other questions, then please just get in touch. Thank you so much, Alex. That was so inspirational. Um, we've got some great feedback already, which I will read out when we get to the Q&A section. But um, yes, as Alex mentioned, we'll be sending everyone who attended the webinar a recording and the attendance certificate for you all to refer back to and share with your colleagues. However, if you do miss that email, you will be able to find the recording on our webinar website. Um, please do contact us at collins.international at halfcollins.co.uk if you have any queries or if you'd like to know more about the Tara and Danny Bin series as part of Collins Big Cat. Um, now on to the Q&A, for which I'm delighted to invite Lizzie Catford, our primary publisher, Lizzie, I wonder if you could just get things started for us by explaining a little bit more about how we came to publish Tara Bins and why it's so important within the classroom. Um, yeah, so Tara Bins is a series of fiction books that we publish and um, it's about a young girl who has a magic dressing up box and she opens up the dressing up box and it gives her a different costume from a different, a different STEM career and she puts on the costume and she's sort of transported off into an adventure where she gets to experience that career and she has to draw on her strengths and you you know draw on the different attributes that that make you successful in that career to sort of experience it and she sort of saves the day and it's a it's a great story and the the books were written by our author Lisa Rajan and Lisa came to us with the idea she's a scientist um, by background and she had two two young boys and then um, she had her daughter and when she came to read books with her daughter she was sort of dismayed to find that she just couldn't find any where there were women or girls 
in those role models, um, you know, sorry, in those in those uh, protagonists who were girls um, doing those those jobs. So it was always men, and she kind of really wanted, as a scientist, to show her daughter that that was possible and to really bust that gender stereotype. So given that she couldn't find the book, she decided to write them herself. And we were really lucky to work with Wise on the books as well. So the Wise team reviewed the stories. And as Alex said, they also got role models from, from industry who were actually doing those careers, who wrote us um, you know, descriptions of their job and gave us, um, gave us activities around them as well. So we could really help inspire children to go on and, and do those roles. And we actually also ended up publishing a slightly younger series as well um, because um, children responded so well to the books and teachers that they asked us um, to have a younger series as well so they could start having those conversations around careers and showing girls, um, women doing these STEM careers a little bit younger. So we introduced Danny Bins as well, who's Tara's little sister and, and um, those books are available too for a younger audience. Thank you so much. I remember working on them when I was interning at Collins and they were definitely part of the reason why I was so keen to stay because not only is the messaging so wonderful but the wide range of roles that are shown and the creativity and just the beautiful illustrations they really make for some lovely engaging reading for um, young readers. Um, we've had uh, some feedback that I'd just like to share because I think it's so important that we have these stories and that we share them but someone has said that in their last role for the entire 12 years that they were there they were constantly asked how did you get a job like this, this when they were actually asking how did a girl like you get a job like this and they're just expressing their sadness at it but also um, they're incredibly grateful that you've helped to break down these barriers within your industry and to show that it is possible um, and I guess for you Alex then something that I'd like to ask is are there um, you spoke about how you know you had to campaign pretty hard to get um, toilets uh, for female employees within the first place that you worked um, but are there other realities of working in um, the STEM industry or in a uh, industry that's dominated by um, men and then if I could flip that on its head Lizzie and ask you if there is any um, any difference when you work in publishing which is a predominantly female-led industry. Um, Alex could I start with you? Yeah so I think I generally I'd say you know I've had a pretty positive experience but there are probably a lot of things I'd never really picked up on or thought about until it was put in front of me by somebody else speaking about it. So things like my coveralls. So if I have coveralls in some places or some countries around the world, ladies coveralls are um, your top and bottoms are separate rather than it being an all-in-one boiler suit and they're tailored to be much more suitable for um, smaller people like I'm five foot four my coveralls are rolled up four or five times to be able to not be tripping over them and one of the bigger ones is your suit for going offshore in a helicopter so you have to wear um, a very special suit which has to have a tight seal around your neck and around your arms to prevent any water getting in in the event of a helicopter helicopter ditching and if that doesn't fit properly you aren't allowed on to the helicopter to be able to go home and I do know two colleagues who have been dropped from the helicopter flight because they didn't have suits that fitted them correctly and when you've already been offshore for three weeks or four weeks and you're looking forward to going home that's not what you want to hear and it's something that's out with your control because you're relying on other people within the logistics team or a third party business to have that for you so there definitely are challenges but it's about making them known and making people aware that they're there so we can can do something about them and um, yes you can yeah. just answer the website yeah so obviously publishing is a very female dominated industry to be honest with you but i think there are still um still areas to sort of challenge and to move forward and i'm lucky i work for a very um a very uh, forward-looking uh, organisation as well that really looks to challenge any kind of um, stereotyping and to ensure diversity and inclusivity at all levels and there's been a big focus on sort of women in leadership and we've been lucky to have some really inspirational speakers come in and talk to us just sort of just show what's possible and sort of challenge again any um, any sort of assumptions that might sit behind any of that. I think in publishing as well we have a really key role that we're obviously part of any debate in this in this space because we put you know we, we 
create content that is then read by children in my role and obviously for adults as well and you know um just thinking about the language we use so it's you know it's fire fighter not fireman when we are editing and creating content and just at every level looking to move away from any assumptions or a, you know and normalizing certain ways of being i think that's a really good point and um you both touched upon this a little bit but I guess starting those conversations um, with colleagues or co-workers um, that might be something that's quite difficult and um, I was wondering if you had any tips for that but also I guess starting those conversations at a younger level for you know people who are maybe not even necessarily thinking about what career they want to do but just to make them aware do you have any tips for that Lizzie could I start with you? Um, well, I think the Tara Bins books are a lovely vehicle for that, to be honest with you, in terms of having conversations around careers and raising aspirations. And that's partly, you know, why I guess Lisa had such a passion for that. And that's why she wrote those titles in the way that she did. That it's really about, um, you know, engaging children in a conversation around careers and presenting really positive um, role models like through Tara who goes out and tries different careers and she has such a positive experience and every book ends with this really positive message of Tara sort of talking directly to the readers so and saying you know you can be anything you want to be you can these are these are what I've learned today you know I could aim high I could be a pilot I could be a doctor and you know having that raising that aspiration and putting it out there and starting to think about it younger because I think it's something that certainly sort of for my generation when I was at school there weren't very many conversations around careers that were sort of touched upon maybe at secondary school around the age of 16 very briefly when we were lined up to do maybe a couple of weeks work experience but it wasn't really something that's definitely not at primary age, young, you know, when children were younger, that there was no conversations around that. And I think having those conversations earlier, starting children thinking, it's not that they have to make a decision, but just sort of showing them what's possible and what's out there is really exciting, especially because we know so many children and, you know, by the time they're at secondary school, so many girls are not choosing to take STEM subjects and already, you know, there's a massive imbalance and that needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed earlier. It needs to be addressed with children because it's already almost too late by the time they get to secondary school because girls and young women are not seeing STEM as something that's for them. So I think, you know, having, you know, like you say, have, just having conversations, talking about it, putting literature out there for children to be able to see women in these roles and normalising that. So there is there is no assumption that, oh, those are those are men's jobs, those are women's jobs, because either way, that's not true. You know, anybody can be anything they want to be. And I think having that that sort of positive mindset and, and, and finding out what what's interesting to you and what your skills you know, will make you really suitable for um, is all part of that, really. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Lizzie. It's so interesting that you say it's all about young children. And one of the things we most commonly find is that by the time schools are asking us to come in to speak to them as part of careers, they've already picked their standard reader GCSE subjects. And if they haven't picked the science, it then becomes much more challenging for them to pick it up at a later stage. So I couldn't agree more that it's got to be about trying to inspire children from, from a younger age. Um, and I've actually got a couple of friends with children who, one of them in particular, Heather, she's just a budding scientist she's had her mum sign up for a monthly kind of subscription pack for them to do these experiments and I quite often get a whatsapp of how do we do this part this has come for this month's experiment and we're not very sure what we're meant to be doing in this house but things like that being able to show um show them what's possible and often she says you know you know mummy's friend does this as a job and she works offshore and she does this and it's just as you say letting children see that you know those people are out there doing those jobs and trying to get people speaking about it I think in terms of trying to approach the conversation whether it's about career or whether it's about trying to raise some of these issues it definitely is um about knowing your audience a little as well um I wouldn't say that you can just go with the same argument to any room it's kind of about tailoring your argument or your point of view to, to who you're speaking to and I particularly found that when I worked in the Middle East because you had to be very very careful there with the cultural difference on things that would maybe be more widely accepted in the UK obviously weren't in the Middle East so I'd say it's about knowing your audience and maybe listening a lot more before you start to speak up on some of the issues so as you can cater what you're speaking about to really hit home with those that you're speaking to. That is such good advice, I think, for life, not just for having difficult conversations, <laughs> to be honest. Um, someone has shared that um, they're really appreciative 
that language is something you're we're focusing on at Collins, um, especially because they work in a male dominated environment. And one of the biggest things that, that they've had to deal with is this kind of idea of stop being so sensitive to jokes or things that typically get taken as banter. And the fact that you both just nodded and grimaced <laughs> shows that that is something that is still um, that we still get today. And um, in terms of, I guess, how we respond to it in a personal, but also a professional context, is there anything that you could um, share with our audience about how you've dealt with situations like that? Um, Alex, can I start with you? Yeah, so I guess um, I'm more often than not just trying to make a joke out of it. Um, I know that my colleague Hazel made a joke earlier talking about when you know you go into a meeting room and you often they say oh well can you just go and get the teas and they automatically point to the women in the room and she quite often says well no one of the guys can get the teas you know everybody's able to do it but I more often than not make a joke out of it because it's easier to sometimes detract from how it sometimes makes you feel to be able to make a bit of a joke out of it makes it a bit easier to manage with but I mean it's definitely still there when I was at university I think there were 12 girls on my course out of about 120 of us um, and you kind of you stuck together um, but certainly in the year that have just left a few years after me it was almost 50 50 so it is getting better but you certainly just yeah I just tried to make a joke out of it and uh, get on with the next one I more often than not whenever I was told you know you only got that because you were a girl I would say well you know you're just jealous it doesn't matter whether I was a girl or not. <laughs> what a great response. Um, Lizzie do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think we're on a positive trajectory here in that things are moving. And I think it's about being confident sometimes to call out something that's not appropriate, to be honest with you. You don't have to do that aggressively or, but, you know, it, it's not OK for somebody to be making somebody else feel awkward within the workspace. And I think, you know, just to sort of... Um, you know, I think because, you know, often you don't want to make somebody else feel awkward or you don't want to make, you know, you feel like you shouldn't say something. But I think if you, you know, it's OK to actually just challenge somebody straight on. And more often than not, I think people are probably a bit mortified that they've dropped into stereotyping or saying something that they didn't really think about how that might impact on somebody else. And, you know, I think it is about continuing that education really for everyone and sort of moving moving forward positively so you don't you know I think it's it's absolutely fine to yeah challenge somebody who said something that you're not comfortable with and you know you can do that and just sort of have that conversation I think it all comes down to like with everything that we're saying really communication isn't it that you you can just speak back to that person that you weren't comfortable with what they said or you didn't feel it was appropriate for these reasons and move on positively rather than just accept that like you say somebody's always going to ask you to make the teas because you're a woman and it's yeah. not okay really yeah I think it's funny you've just point. you've just reminded me Lizzie of something it's when we first all went to working in this virtual world you know I you just called Alex but my full name is Alexandra and people in a meeting just will often call me Alex and we don't use video a lot um when we first went to a virtual working world and I was put on this new project and every time the email came the email said hi gents just to give you an update this is what's been happening and the first time it happened I thought oh it's just slip you know he's used to emailing guys all the time it's fine then we went on the first two meetings and every time he came on the meeting it was like hi gents how are we all doing this afternoon and I eventually just said to him I said look I know you probably don't realize you're even doing this but it's really frustrating when there's two females on this team and everything who, that you send is addressed to just gents um, and as you say he was totally mortified that he'd fallen into this bias and he actually was really grateful to have had it pointed out to him so yeah it, you're totally right it's just about letting people know. Yeah and I think with that as well it's um I always, always see it as such an act of uh, care if someone points out a mistake that I've made because, you know, they've taken the time to not only potentially make it a little bit awkward, but also to, to make to make me want to be better. And I take it as a huge compliment that someone would give me that time and space and energy, but also trust me to respond appropriately. So, yeah, I think it's a really good point that you make. Um, Hi, gents is quite funny though, I do have to say. <laughs> Um, Alex, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about WISE itself. I know you touched on it, but do you have any particular highlights um, that you're able to share with us? I think that's something that um, our audience really wants to know more about. Yeah, so um, WISE on the whole have a, a large range of um, 
resources available, whether that be online webinars that you can dial into or packs similar to what I mentioned about doing the classroom exercises. There's access to things like that as well on the website. But one of the most amazing tools that I have that's a real highlight for me is My Skills, My Life. So this is almost a bit like a digital version of the role model side of the Tara and Danny Bin stuff. This is a website where many people who like me work in industry have gone on and put in things that they're good at, subjects that they enjoyed at school, kind of the things that led you to where you are you fill in your profile and you save it and then when children come to do it it then gives them people in their area who are just like them that they can reach out to and get in touch with for maybe like a mentorship kind of thing or just if you wanted to see you know what are some of the opportunities if I like these subjects and it's something that can be really useful for teachers and parents as well going back to that space about making sure you've got the right information to be able to give to children when they ask questions about you know well I'm good at this so what do you think I could do I think there is such a common stereotype when I was at school that if you got good grades and you did science you were going to be a doctor and that's just not the world that we're in anymore there are so many amazing opportunities and whilst going to be a doctor is still such a great opportunity and really good it's not for everybody um, and just because you're good at sciences and get those good grades that's not always the one to go to. So My Skills, My Life is, is a really fantastic resource. And also, I think one of the other highlights from being part of WISE and on the, the WISE campaign board has been speaking really to male allies that we have in the sector as well. We did a blog piece as part of the Young Professionals Board um, part last year it would be now and we reached out to all of those who'd previously been nominated for the MAN award as part of the WISE awards and we were looking at how important male allies were in the industry and to have you know I'm sure many people have heard on International Women's Day, people always say, well, when's International Men's Day? And I always make sure that I know the date so I can go back to them and say, actually, it's on this date and this is a day where we celebrate all of those things. But we made a really big push to, on International Women's Day last year, celebrate male allies who celebrated women in their field and were a real help in the industry. And that was something that was a really brilliant project to be a part of. It's really nice to be able to know that you can you have female counterparts that support you throughout your career, but equally so, it's really important to have those male ones too. That sounds incredible. Actually, it links really nicely onto my next question, um, which uh, I guess for each of you, what are some of the key attributes and qualities of, su of success for someone in your field? Um, Lizzie, can I start with you? Um, so I suppose working in publishing, I ultimately I think you just have to love books and believe in books and that will drive you through everything else because it's it's like any any role really you need a whole range of skills I think you need the communication you need the problem solving skills you need um, that attention to detail um, if you're working on an editing books you need the creativity to work out why it's something makes a great read and something else might not and to bring together an illustrator and a writer together to create a sort of vision for for a book um, and also the sort of research skills in a way to go out and find out and I spend in my role as a publisher a lot of time in classrooms talking to teachers talking to children to really uh, understand what, what books are needed and I think always as well in any career you need to be willing to learn and we've talked a lot about sort of communication and role models and I'm so lucky to have worked throughout my career with so many different inspiring uh, uh, people who've been so willing to share their knowledge with me and to take the time to teach me and to to sort of bring me on and to encourage me and I think having that as well within any career is just so important really to show what's possible and to give you that belief that you can go on to achieve something and that what you're doing is is a great contribution to society and to a broader culture and, and, and that kind of thing really and I think sort of finding that and, and what you enjoy um, is really important at career because you spend an awful lot of time at work at the end of the day so if you if you don't enjoy what you do it must be such a drag and so I think finding something which sort of really brings together the things you enjoy that lets you feel successful because you're you're using the skills that you're good at I think is really important and makes for a really happy life in a way so I think it, that's why it's so important in a way that we have some of these conversations with children and we start to sort of think about careers in different roles and not closing off any careers to children I think often as well you know if you're from a middle class background or from a highly educated background with your family then you know you will sort of 
friends of the family be doing different roles you might know about them but I think it's really important that schools do that because not every child has that and it's sort of raising that awareness and raising that aspiration and showing what's possible I think is really important because you know half of these STEM careers I think people don't know are out there and are open to them and possible to go on and do these things so I think that's why we really need to sort of raise awareness around them. Yeah, I would say that um, one of the biggest things in problem solving is uh, in engineering, sorry, is problem solving and knowing that uh, when it goes wrong, you just go back and start again and pick yourself back up and move on with it. So it's really important to have initiative and be able to have a bit of a get up and go attitude. In my role, you know, every day is different. And finally, the days that stick in your head are the days when loads of things went wrong because you learn the most and you learn what you would and wouldn't do again. Um, and probably just having the confidence to go and speak to a range of different people and having the soft skills to be able to get on with people and know how to pull on the different strengths of a different department you work with. I couldn't count on one hand the number of different people and different teams that I require with their skills to work on projects and different issues each day and if I wasn't confident enough to go and speak to those different people it'd be really difficult to get my job done working in silos so that's one of the biggest things and I completely agree with what Lizzie said about um, you know we often find that not all children have access to those role models and resources like some other families may and I remember when I was um, being interviewed for the WISE award and I was asked if you were to make one difference or had one idea about schools what would you do and I suggested that they should have a mini careers fair at parents night and then um, when the parents were there finding out about what their kids were good at at school you had people from whether it be universities or companies telling them about the apprenticeships and different courses that their children could go on to do and the different careers because it's also quite often hard to find um, sometimes sadly to have people's parents be engaged and if they're not kind of caught and given the information there and then often it can fall on deaf ears and that's where it's so important for the teachers to be equipped with that information to be able to inspire them and help them too. Great thank you I'm so sorry I've had to come off camera because my internet is being quite laggy but um, something that's, okay. that's just popped up in the Q&A box which I think is a wonderful question and Lizzie I think it's probably something that you could answer though Alex do feel free to chime in um, is there anything you feel that we can do on a national level to encourage girls to get into STEM careers, either in the curriculum or similar? Yeah, I mean, I think there's already a lot of activity out there. And on the Tara Bins um, books, we worked with the Institute of Physics on an initiative they had around gender action, because there's obviously such a high level of concern, in particular in physics and girls taking those those subjects. I think there's always more you can do. Um, and I think it, it, it's it's going younger, I think, has been the sort of outcome of a lot of that, because, as we said already, that by um, secondary age, it seems that some mindsets are already fixed and young women are already not taking those subjects that will enable them to go on and have STEM careers. So I think it's about at, at, at a primary level with young children having having those role models, as we've been talking about, and like them seeing, because if you can't see it and you're not seeing that reflected back to you then you almost don't imagine it and it's it's normalizing it and showing um throughout different in, in different spaces around a school you know women doing those those roles whether it's through posters whether it's through um auditing books within a library having those conversations having speakers in it's really i think it's it's all of those things really and um and, and working with children at a younger level on it yeah, I completely agree, Lizzie, and I think it's also about showing um, showing young girls and young children that, you know, I I really enjoyed being in a boiler suit and being uh, dirty with grease and whatever else, trying to put engine parts back together in the same when I worked at the gas terminal, but that's not all that an engineer looks like, and that is the common um, misconception, you know, how I look today is how I look going into the office as an engineer now in the role that I work in. And, you know, I know friends from university who work in the cosmetic sector as an engineer and they go in every day and they're their heels in their bags. So I think it's also about showing that what you may think is what an engineer looks like isn't what they look like. And we have a there's a programme I've been involved with for quite a few years now called Girls in Energy, where we take a group of girls from a number of Scot Scottish schools and we immerse them in a girls only environment and have them do uh, some more kind of engineering related classes and they get a certificate at the end of it. And they also are given some work experience within Shell. We take them to show them what the heliport looks like, explain to them about going offshore. And a lot of them are really grateful to be in an environment away from their 
male counterparts, but also a lot of them are at say it wouldn't bother them to be doing it also along with boys. And one that's really stuck in my head from that a couple of years ago was a young girl who said that before she did the Girls in Energy course, she had never thought about working in STEM. And then we had her come back two years later to share her story. And she actually was at university studying civil engineering, looking at how she could get to work in the decommissioning part of oil and gas. So simple stories like that make it really worthwhile. And if you just inspire one person who can then share their story to help others, that all compounds to make a really big difference. That's an amazing story. Thank you so much. Um, just to end on then, um, if there's one thing that you would really, really love our audience to take away from this webinar session, um, the floor is yours. Um, Alex, I'll start with you. What is it that you want our audience to take away from this? The most important um, pearl of wisdom, if you will. Uh, yeah, I would say it's to um, be, be equipped with the knowledge so you can help your students. Make sure that you make use of all of the resources that are out there. And if you know people that you know, whether it's from your personal friends or other people that you may know through some networking events, have them speak to your children. You know, more often than not, people from industry are so willing to come in and speak to schools or speak at events to be able to share that story. And I really believe word of mouth and inspiring people is what gets people thinking, oh, I'd really like to be like them or I can could do that so that would be my biggest piece of advice please be as equipped with the information to inspire your uh, children in your classes yeah I mean I really just echo that again to be honest with you I think as teachers and it's it's you know it's so fantastic to see so many people joining today and engaging with this issue and obviously it's it's important to you all to, to be here today and I think you know you have such an important role in people's lives because everybody remembers their teachers and remembers being in, at school and you know sort of taking the opportunity to to engage with children to talk about these things to to you know help raise aspirations show children what's possible I think it's such a such an important you have such an important role within that and um, it, it's fantastic to see so many people um, engaging with this issue so positively to be honest with you. Yeah I couldn't agree more I just actually want to finish up the webinar now but um, before I do a huge thank you to both you Alex and to Lizzie and to our audience and I just want to read out this one lovely comment that we've got in the chat um, it's from someone who uh, studied physics and then began their teaching career as a secondary physics teacher. And the fact that so few girls came up to secondary school enjoying science or thinking that maths and science was too difficult for them, then inspired her to move to primary education and catch the children when they were young. because She believes that STEM oh. create our future innovators and leaders. So thank you so much for being so positive, for sharing your experiences and uh, do take care and have a lovely day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.